was, was I don't know why they do so it. Just shows up again. Uh, if we're going live. Yeah. Yeah. How late are we? Ten minutes. Ten minutes. How many viewers have we got? Only one. Only one. Okay. Tell me when you got my voice. Oh, we've got 11 now. 11 now. Hello everybody, a few technical difficulties. Shelly's just going to tell me when we're all clear to go with the audio. Can you see me now? Give me the thumbs up when you're happy. You're going to have to click across that PowerPoint to get the slides to the top of you. Are you happy? Okay, let's go. <laughs> Hello, everybody, and thank you for your patience, and uh, thanks for waiting. We've just had to solve an internet uh, streaming problem here in our office. Uh, one of the things we try to do is to stream this to you in HD so that you can watch it back over YouTube later on, and our internet connection upload speed has slowed down today. Uh, so anyway, we're, we're all good. Uh, that technical issue has been resolved. And what I'm here to do today is say thanks very much um, to you for joining us. And I've, I've spent um, the last couple of weeks pulling together this content, uh, which is sort of a, the wrap of, of many, many years of running best practice um, and many, many years of thinking about our own system um, and putting a mirror up and saying, okay, well, from an integrated management systems perspective, uh, what do we do? So for those of you that haven't met me, I'm, my name is Kobe Simmon. I'm the CEO here at Best Practice. Some of you are smiling because you know me very well, um, and uh, definitely some of you I've spoken to in the last 24, 48 hours. So uh, welcome and thanks for joining us. So for those of you that don't know me, my name's Kobe Simmet. I'm the CEO here at Best Practice. I started the business and I run the business on a day-to-day -day basis. So for 90% of the time, I'm the CEO here and I'm the leader of an amazing team of people that I love. Um, and we have a 24 seven operation that's just totally switched on. Uh, always listening to you and always listening to uh, what we can do to help. Um, and, uh, and as part of that process, I've consolidated my thoughts. Obviously, we talk about these particular topics, but uh, it's not just all about me and my opinion. I bring, those, uh, I bring those opinions and thoughts and ideas through from our team, and hopefully today I can solve you some problems. So I've got a couple of requests of you, some housekeeping issues. If for some reason you lose the stream and you lose access to this live feed, don't panic because we'll send out a link. We're recording it. We always record the webinars that we run and you will be issued with the link and you'll be able to re-watch the webinar. So I really do value your time and taking the time out today to, uh, to watch this webinar. Uh, but you can also press pause at any time. Now I'll obviously keep proceeding through the webinar uh, and, and your time will be paused, uh, but you can come back and press play. So if the phone rings, if there's something urgent that you need to do, if you've got to go up and, and uh, if you've got to get up and leave, uh, please feel free to do that. Um, it, it won't be lost, which is uh, which is the most critical part of our technology here is uh, is being able to come back to this live event. So you have this to refer back to. The second piece of housekeeping is I'm obviously going to go through some slides, which I've got here, um, uh, this sort of stuff. And you, you've, if you've seen these webinars before, and uh, if you're watching on a mobile device, so yes, you can watch on a mobile device. You can sort of switch up. Uh, you can pick up the email if you get those emails with the links on your mobile device. You can pick up and watch. Uh, through our training academy on a mobile device and if you know how to do a screenshot uh, and you see a particular slide you can screenshot that slide so uh, if you can't do that now definitely um, make, make a note of the time so if you look at the minutes seconds and minutes and seconds at the bottom of the screen make a note of the time when I said something that you thought was very valuable and come back to that time and do a screenshot so if you're at a desktop um, work out how to do your screenshot on your machine or a mobile device um, for an iPhone for example you press the home button and the power button We'll take a screenshot and there's your notes so you can refer back to those pictures so a modern way of note taking if you like now the third request is um is a couple of things shelly is in the corner here jack's behind the camera so there's uh, there's other people here helping me make this um uh, available to you and shelly's uh my phone is somewhere jack's got my phone and if you'd like to, if you have a question and please ask questions because we've got a small intimate group today you're all members of the best practice family uh, and if you'd like to ask a question, you can do that in one of two ways. One of three ways. 
Uh, you could send an email while I'm presenting to the marketing email address at best practice, and that'll come in through our email system. Uh, or you could send me a personal message on LinkedIn, and my phone is there right in front of Jack, and Jack will read out the question. And also, Shelley uh, is monitoring our Facebook page. So if you'd like, I would love questions. That's going to make this amazing. Uh, it's going to make it more interactive, and it's going to make it more targeted. So be selfish uh, through the time here today. I've got tons of time. I don't need to be anywhere this afternoon. I just need to pick my son up from karate. Um, at, uh, at about um, five o'clock uh, after he's finished school. So that's all I need to do, but I can keep presenting. Uh, we can take this into a mobile thing and I can keep asking question, uh, answering questions. So please ask the questions, get those questions ready. I've obviously got some content to share and I'll definitely do that, um, but the questions are gonna be the things that, uh, that are gonna help you really move forward. So I'll give you those answers. If I know the answer to the question or if I can, um, if I can interpret it for you, then I'll do that. If not, I'll come back to you. So. Please keep those questions going backwards and forwards. I'll make myself available uh, through the evening, this evening on LinkedIn. So Shelley's monitoring the company, Best Practice Facebook page, and Jack's monitoring my LinkedIn. Okay, Jack, let's go. We're gonna move through some slides. Um, one important thing for those of you who have not participated in one of these webinars before is to understand that there is a bunch of stuff happening for you to complement what we're doing today that's free, and that is our Facebook page, which is Best Practice Certification, our YouTube channel, our link company LinkedIn page, our Instagram, and if we're starting to play with Snapchat and we're looking at how that can add value to your life and, and help you guys to keep improving every day. Uh, and I can say that today we've put a couple of posts out on Facebook, we've put a video up on YouTube, uh, we've put a post up on LinkedIn and then speed three or four photos go up on Instagram. That's just today. So every day uh, we're, we're running a social media campaign which is all about providing content and thought and inspiration. So the interaction with best practice is a daily thing. It's not that we do a best practice audit and it's every six months, it's daily. And so I want you guys to understand that that content is there. And if you're sitting on the couch at night and you're sort of downloading from the day and you might say, hey, what were best practice up today? up to today, we're sharing that on a day-to-day -day basis, sharing our journey so that you can see what we're up to. If you don't care, that's fine. <laughs> um, you know, it might not be your thing, but uh, but there's definitely a lot going on. So Shelley might be posting quotes of inspiration. I post articles, share articles. I watched a great video on YouTube this morning, uh, an interview or, or a joint collaboration between Simon Sinek and Gary Vaynerchuk. Um, and, uh, and that's up on our Facebook page. It's a great video, it's about 20 minutes. Um, some compelling stuff there which is excellent. Okay, Jack, let's go through this. Okay, so I want to get right into it today. Uh, there's no veiled sales pitches today. Today is about content for you. I'll just move out of the way and show you this little model. Today we're talking about quality, uh, environment screen here, and then safety here in red. Uh, and, um, and that's sort of a small model about integrated management systems. But I think that probably draws on the first point that I'll make shortly in terms of what is included in integrated management system and what's not. But let's just quickly talk about uh, this definition uh, that I've got up here, um, uh, which is that an integrated management system or a management system is the framework of policies, processes and procedures used by an organisation to ensure that it can fulfil all tasks required to achieve its objectives. So let's talk about the most common thing that all organisations do, and that is handle money. So without money, obviously, organisations fail to exist, and all organisations fail money, and I, sorry, handle money, and I, and I think that's probably the, the first thing to use in terms of context here, because I'm talking about integrated management systems, and I'm talking about organisations. So we want to make sure that we're talking about all of those aspects. So if we use a financial management system as an example, we say that any policies that you've got around expenditure, purchasing, procurement, um, sales, customer service, how you deal with the financial transaction that, you know, that, that's with your products and services. What are your policies, processes, procedures that you use to fulfill your objective, which is financial sustainability or making profit or not losing money? Um, so there's things in there around ethics, there's things in there around integrity, things in there around you know, how people are paid, what's talked about, what's not talked about, what's secure, what's not secure. Um, what's monitored, what's not monitored. Those are all the sorts of things. So when we bring that framework, my first observation has been that organisations have integrated management systems and we're all practitioners of quality, safety, environment, data security, 
but we fail to make that link to that very important management system, which is our financial management system. So when I sat down to, you know, we talked about what would this webinar entail and how can we do this download of this, you know, unique information that we have here at Best Practice, the biggest failing that we see out in the marketplace when we're doing our assessments is that there's no link between the quality system and the financial system, except that, you know, the organisation might say in a flowchart, we do tendering. You know, and then we go and do the you know, project management. And in fact, where I'm standing right here, I can see, I can see someone in a high vis orange vest out on a construction site. We're in an uh, office tower. Um, there's a construction site at a, a large shopping centre across. You know, it's, a, it's across two roads, so it's two blocks from here. And I can see someone standing on the roof. Now they're doing a service. They're actually doing construction. And what you know, it's it's likely that we would go into a quality assurance audit on that construction site. What we wouldn't see is the linkage. You know, in terms of the ethics and the processes around the financial management, we just see the sort of, oh, financial's all very quiet and it's over here, let's talk about the quality system. And so the biggest efficiency that I'd like you to consider is how does your quality system or your management system cover and is it integrated with your financial management system? So the bookkeeper, the financial person, the person that's in control of the bank account, the checkbook, purchase orders, procurement, all that sort of stuff, how are those two things integrated? Because they, you know, that's the critical part of this. And, and ISO 9001, the quality management standard, talks about that. What are your critical processes? So how do you procure your suppliers? And, and you know, how do you procure your raw materials? How do you procure your goods? And what are the checks and balances that you go through there? Uh, there is a factory that I'm aware of that's very close to here that's operating. And they can't procure raw materials at the moment because they haven't paid their suppliers because they've got cash flow problems. And so there's not many businesses that operate completely free of cash flow problems, particularly when they're growing. And so that does affect their ability to supply, it's affecting their ability to make promises to their customers, and it's affecting their ability to continue to deliver an amazing service because their, their, their key core suppliers are calling them at the moment and saying, we need to be paid, we need to be paid. So they're sort of reluctant to deliver amazing service because they don't know if they're going to get paid or not. And so it does really start to affect your quality management system. It then starts to affect morale internally in the business, which is your safety management system. Um, and it can make you cut corners, so it might affect your environmental management system with waste and pollution and, uh, and, and how, you know, how waste products are handled. So it is important. That's the biggest efficiency we see. So let's get back to this definition. Let's talk about this one. Got to get my hands around the right way because everything's backwards here in the screen in front of me. Um, what's an integrated management system? That's a management system, uh, and we go over here, that's structured and implemented so an organisation operates as a single unit with unified objectives. So if you, you know, in this field of management systems that, that we here at Best Practice operate within and then equally you guys are operating in as you execute and implement your management systems, a very common observation is that there's lots of silos and often, again I say financial, even some of the legal matters and HR, they're often very isolated from the quality safety environment management system. And so you're probably starting to think this, this sounds like a lot of hard work. I'm hopefully going to give you some tips and tricks as to how to make that a little bit easy or make it easier to integrate. Because it, look, I think we have to be realistic that it is challenging, however, uh, you know, everybody that subscribes to this webinar today, you're all professionals and you're all senior professionals in your respective organisations um, and well into your careers. And it is important to recognise that if anyone's going to be able to solve these challenges, it's us together as a team. So uh, let's have a positive mindset as we go through that and, uh, and look into it. And then obviously the, the final point there at the bottom uh, down here is organisations often focus on management systems individually. Uh, often in silos and sometimes even in conflict, and that's often the case. Uh, particularly, I'll draw the I'll draw the um, um, connection to construction, where uh, contractors are often selected on price by uh, senior executives, and that's a very common observation of ours. And the guys at the coal face, the site managers and supervisors, they know a particular contract is, contractor is going to do an amazing job. They they'll, they'll, it will be flawless. There won't be any management problems yet. The contractor with the cheapest price is selected and the cheap contract that ends up costing more in the long run um, because they're poor quality in terms of how they manage themselves. So that's what we're talking about here. We're talking about integrating those systems and saying let's bring 
you know, if we're selecting suppliers, let's not select the supply based on price. Let's look at a well-rounded risk management approach to key suppliers for our business and look at the life cycle cost of that supplier as they contribute to uh, the bottom line in terms of what we're doing. And, um, and obviously then we can start to really consider the actual cost rather than just constantly choosing the cheapest price. Okay, Jack, next slide. Thank you. Okay, so what we've got here is some common system elements. And so the first thing that I think that people, you know, the, the, the first bit of content here in terms of questions is starting to look at, okay, well, and this is probably where, where you can start to uh, make some notes in terms of what we talk about, is that uh, if we said what, what would be the common elements if we're looking at a number of standards, including your financial system. So that's where we want to go from here with this conversation. Don't forget HR, don't forget finance, don't forget legal, don't forget risk, don't forget quality, safety, environment, all those management systems. So we're talking about the core operating management functions of an organisation. This is sort of my, you know, my brain dump, if you like, in terms of what the common elements would be. Uh, we've got leadership, involvement and responsibility. Ultimately, as the CEO here at Best Practice, I'm responsible for the profit and loss and the balance sheet, whether that's monthly or whether that's annually. And you know, we've got payroll to pay every fortnight, we've got suppliers to pay, we've got all of those things to do, and that's ultimately my responsibility and I'm the ultimate financial authority. And, and equally, I would be that person for our quality system, well, I am that person for our quality system and our safety system. So that sort of said, okay, well, where does this all start? You do see these headings as you get through each of the management system standards, and it, and it, and it is important to start to look at um, you know, how those things all tie together. Uh, identification and compliance with legislation and industry standards. Now, when we talk about a quality management system, you know, what standards, codes of practice, um, industry standards, if you like, even if they're, if they're, they're spoken industry standards but not documented industry standards about how things are done, like the real estate industry, for example, there's not a lot of industry standards around how the transactions happen, but there's just industry standards about, you know, you put a sign up out the front, you do advertising in the local paper. I'm talking about those sorts of industry standards, the basic expectation of the customer. Uh, but let's also talk about, well, when we talk about identification and compliance with legislation, we've got tax law. So, you know, from you guys here in terms of the audience that are watching this live feed, um, you've got tax law, you've got employment law, you've got those governance standards and they do affect, they do affect how you operate. Uh, contractor law, um, and, and so there's statute law and then there's civil law. So they form part of that sort of common element in terms of how we operate. And then we've got other things. If you're in construction, you've got the Australian standards and building codes and you know American standards and British standards, all the different standards depending on where you're building. Uh, all the product standards for where you're manufacturing, all the service standards for wh what you're doing. So I think that's an important element. Employee selection, placement, competency, sorry, and competency assurance. Obviously, organisations made up of people um, to a certain extent. Uh, some organisations more automated than others, um, but in principle, there's you know one or two or hundreds of thousands of people, and uh, they're a core element and a key element in terms of how systems are structured and how we get those humans to act. Uh, some of you might have heard me talk about the cookbook analogy with regards to you know, what are the simple sets of instructions that we can give people to you know, act and repeat a behaviour over and over again and, and, and what do we do from a systems perspective. So companies typically race off, or organisations typically race off and write thousands and thousands of guideline documents and I don't know if that's the best approach. Um, I certainly have experienced here in our company that it's not the best approach. We can write lots of documents, but I can just about guarantee that no one will read them, even here at best practice. So I look outside of our industry and I look towards, say, high performance, and I say, okay, well, from a human perspective, where are the high performing humans? Or what, you know, what types of humans spring to mind when we talk about high performance? And the things right now that spring to mind are racing car drivers. Uh, football players, netball players, swimmers, um, bands and musical artists, um, TV presenters, uh, all of those sort of high performance individuals that we engage with on a you know on a one on one basis um, through different media on a day to day basis. And uh, you know even myself today, I haven't got you know well, lots of work instructions in terms of how to actually run this webinar and how to talk and all that sort of stuff. It just comes with practice. And so I think that's probably the point I'm making here is that. You know, small pieces of guidance uh, and engineered systems are good, 
but then obviously um, we've got to build that into our management system. So employee selection, placement, competency, a core part of any management system and definitely something that can be integrated. Uh, obviously workforce involvement, and I won't spend too much time on this, but you know, definitely um, you know, having, I, I can't sit here and tell Jack how to drive a camera because he's better at it. Um, yes, I might be his boss in the traditional sense, but, um, but he's really the boss of all of this. And Shelley's sitting here looking after the social media and the administration, and she knows more about it than me. So I've got to engage them in terms of designing an amazing system and presenting an amazing webinar to you guys. So we've got to think about that workforce involvement, core part of any management system, and, and then looking at the bespoke skill sets of, of the different people within an organisation as we bring it together. And I'll talk about how to do that in a couple of slides time. Communication with stakeholders um, and other um, peripherally impacted operations. So, and, and that's, you know, stakeholders. And so with all of the new international standards that have been released, we've got the update and revision of ISO 9001 and everyone's transitioning there. We've got environment standard and everyone's transitioning to the new standard there. Uh, and safety, we've got ISO 45001. Uh, on its way out towards the end of this year or next year. We've got ISO 31000, which is the risk standard, and I'll talk more about that shortly. Uh, we've got business continuity, a whole bunch of those standards. They're all now talking about who are your other stakeholders because they've got a significant ability to affect you. Key supplier drops out. Uh, for this webinar, a key supplier is Telstra. So the Telstra service, you know, the optic fiber system is not working well, which is why we had a delayed start but now we're running off um, a point-to-point -point wireless system. So literally behind the camera that I'm looking straight down at the moment is a mobile phone tower, and uh, we're running the live stream, stream out via a mobile phone. So you know, if we talk about this environment that's happening right now so that we can deliver amazing service to you, we've got a core provider there. And so when we're thinking about communication with stakeholders, we've got to think about those periphery, uh, you know, sometimes quietly, covertly hostile suppliers that are around us because they can affect our performance and, and, um, and our organisation going forward. And that's probably to the point where I'll start to introduce the concept of risk, risk identification and risk management. So we move down to identification and assessment of potential failures and other hazards. So um, if you guys are happy to continue to use the term risk and risk management and integrated risk management, I draw your attention now to ISO 31000 which talks about the risk management framework. So as we start to unpack the risk horizon for any organisation, financial, human resources, customer consumer law, um, quality assurance, safety, you know, oh and and all the oh and laws, manufacturing standards, environmental laws, um, it's, it's all those sorts of things. We can start to look at identification assessment of potential failures um, and we can use the word risk. Uh, obviously, documentation records and knowledge management. Uh, I'm very much a candidate for advocating um, knowledge management in place of documents. I'm not a fan of documents. However, um, I did sit with Arun, uh, our, our quality manager here at Best Practice this morning, and talk about, look, I, he, he said to me, what are your pain points? And I said, well, one of my pain points is I'm watching processes constantly changing and I'm seeing people, you know, a task is delegated to someone and then I go back and see them a week later and somebody else is doing the task and I'm like, well, hang on a minute, I thought it was delegated to you. And they're like, no, 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 someone else has picked it up and run with it. I'm like, well, what does our procedure say? And so I think that, you know, when we're trying to actually repeat an amazing behaviour and improve it, uh, we're, too, we're too quick to change things and move things around without actually letting it get some time to organically grow and improve and get better and better at what we're doing. And so, you know, even here at Best Practice where our documentation is light and our knowledge management is good, uh, we do have to follow through and have some things recorded so we can come back to them and we can say, no, no, we need to hold people accountable. So there's two parts to that. There's a part about uh, guidance so that you know, some, when someone new starts, they can read the process, they can receive, read the procedure, but there's also this piece about accountability. And I'm hearing accountability more and more uh, in terms of holding people accountable to the process because that process has been designed, it's been thought about, um, it's been tested, it's been tried, and too often people move away from it. And, and let's go back to the cookbook example and the, and the cooking the amazing chocolate cake example. You've got an amazing recipe, it's been tried and tested by an international chef, but you think you might leave one ingredient out because you're better at cooking than they are. 
So we've really just got to think about that. Um, I'm getting smiles from um, from these guys. Shelley's very service, but <laughs> serious, but Jack's laughing. Is that um, yes? You know, we, we need to be thinking about okay, well, respecting that, and you guys as professionals out there building these management systems for your organisations, it's important that you campaign that and accountability is a core part. It's not about fear mongering with teams, but it's about using documentation, records, you know, the stuff we're talking about down here, documentation records, to contain that knowledge management and use it for guidance and also holding people accountable. Obviously documented procedures, uh, which is up here above my head, um, is, um, is a core part of some of the international standards and there's some mandatory procedures because the international committees that design these standards recognise that they are critical and there isn't another way to, uh, to communicate that information. Obviously project monitoring, status and handover, in your, any organisation there's always change and often I see change management not well handled and we're not immune. Best practice here with our projects, uh, we're not very good at project management, I'll be open to admit that. Um, and so, you know, how we handle and manage projects is, is definitely a challenge for us. And so we have to keep looking at that and that's a critical part of any management system. And then obviously the management of interfaces. So in, we have a challenge here at the moment at best practice is how our operations team interface with our finance team on a particular area of risk. Um, and it's been moderately uncontrolled because of our growth. Initially when we started the business, it wasn't business, it wasn't an issue. But now with a huge team out assessing every day, uh, it's becoming a bit of a critical financial issue and, and, and we've had some uh, disasters, shall we say. So I guess what I wanted to just round out there for you, um, if you're madly taking notes or if you need to do a screenshot, is, is what is our sort of interpretation of common system elements when we look across any type of system and then we can sort of dig down and we can sort of talk to how we can start to integrate it. So if your question is what are the elements of a management system you can integrate, this is the list. Okay, let's move on. Thanks, Chuck. Okay, so um, let's talk about some of the benefits. And let's talk about um, how that sort of works in terms of what we can do. So um, why do organisations integrate their management systems and what are the benefits? Obviously, avoiding duplication is, is probably the first and most critical one there. Now, I'll, I'll just talk about some basic principles. For those of you that have got a quality safety environment or data security management system or a risk management system or a business continuity management system, across those standards you will see the words management review, you'll see internal audit, you'll see document control procedure or records control procedure, you'll see policy. So there's obviously that opportunity to not have three internal audit procedures or three management reviews or four or five. Um, most organisations that work with us here at Best Practice have got three management systems, quality, safety, environment. It's what we call an IMS or integrated management system. So uh, obviously we can avoid that duplication straight off the bat. With the exception of maybe policies and I'm going to talk about that later on. Obviously gaining commercial efficiencies because we're not duplicating, we're not employing a quality manager, a safety manager, an environment manager. We might have a systems manager as appropriate but we can talk about how to, uh, how to make those decisions or what to include in those decisions. Strategically manage business risk. That's probably my most important point that I want to make in terms of looking at those other management systems and ensuring that it's all bundled into one operations manual. Uh, strengthening business resilience and then obviously prioritising improvements. Now too often I see something like a safety improvement when really the financial system needs some work and financial management and cash flow management and profit management uh, need some work but we see organisations charging off and getting certified because they want to break into a new area of work and while that's great for us because we pick up another customer I sort of you know in some instances I'll say look let's just slow down with this certification journey because we can see that there's some financial issues and the first time I see that come to fruition is when we then say okay well we've done all this work for you can we get paid and they're like actually cash is really tight for us can we pay you next month and so that tells me that you know, automatically tells me that, oh, hang on a minute, um, are they just playing games from a financial perspective or have they got financial issues or maybe the financial issue should have been worked on first before we went and got certified. So we've just got to manage that delicate balance, um, but it's something to consider in terms of how we go forward. All right. Okay. Uh, and what are some, con some common struggles? So um, ladies and gentlemen, now is the time to uh, reach out to me either on LinkedIn and send me a message, Jack's got my phone or Shelley via Facebook if some questions have popped up 
uh, they can read them out to me. So um, if you have jumped from our training academy across the YouTube, you can press a button there at the bottom of the screen uh, and you can watch on YouTube and there's a comments field. Uh, you can just click that button and just type a comment and Shelley will see it. So um, I've obviously got a few more slides, but as we, um, as we sort of lead into this, um, I've got tons of time, but um, start getting those questions ready. So I'm going to talk about some, um, you know, how I would approach it in a second uh, as we go. Um, but it's definitely, um, it's definitely something to think about from a questions perspective. So some common struggles. It's easy to do the first 20%, but after that it gets really hard. And probably the first thing that I see people do, and it's probably the first thing that I recommend that you didn't do, was have an integrated policy. So I see a quality safety environment policy one page, and people get quite caught up in what to write on that. Now I think my recommendation here is that your customers might want to see a specific quality policy or a safety policy or an environment policy, and your staff might want to know what the financial policies are. And so I do think that at that point in time, they'd be three documents that you wouldn't integrate. And so I see it, you know, it's really easy to obviously write that. You can write, you can be the systems manager, you can write that in isolation and you can push out this document to the organisation, but people get confused. And so, the, you know, the struggle is that we see, you know, the documentation being the focus instead of the system, um, and that's where it gets really hard. So the first 20% easy, after that gets really hard. And what I was thinking was that once you get to 80%, the remaining 20% never gets done. And that would probably be the other, um, you know, Pareto principle in terms of 80-20. Uh, the common struggle is that silos still exist and have nothing to do with the management system. In 85% of our clients, and that is 750 companies that we're currently auditing once or twice a year, um, we would see that the financial system sits completely independent of the quality safety environment system and even the HR system, with the exception of maybe job descriptions. So that's something for you guys to consider. That uh, that means that out of this audience, that um, you know, there's a there's a large percentage that that have that situation existing. And I would ask you why, and I would ask you what are the benefits of keeping those systems separate. And if you're happy with those benefits, then please do it. But uh, what we're talking about here is trying to be cost effective and efficient and have transparency across the organisation. Now, not transparency for everyone to see, but transparency from a leadership perspective, so that we can see all of the metrics and all of the dashboards that we need to see to lead and run and control and monitor our organisations. And that's something that I do here at Best Practices. I've got 30 statistics on a dashboard and then I've got different critical dashboards for different systems, but I can see them all from sort of one central integrated place and that's an important thing for you guys to consider. It's not perfect by any means because we're not perfect, but it's certainly a good start so that people can see what they need to see to make their decisions. And that's part of this sort of delegate and elevate principle that we have here from a leadership perspective. I can't do everything um, and neither can our managers. And so it's seeing the things they need to see in the places they need to see them, but so it's integrated and it talks to each other. Okay, um, one of the very common struggles right at a grassroots level with integrated management systems in our industry is that safety takes over every discussion and people are too scared to talk about financial or quality issues when safety is on the table. And so. I'll talk about my recommendations further into this presentation, but it is a critical point to consider there with, you know, okay, let's talk about safety, put it on the agenda, give it a time slot, and then give the other subject matter areas the respect they deserve because they are critical. And in fact, without good quality products and services, you don't need safety because your organisation will fail and cease to exist. So that's a critical point. If you need a sales pitch to take back to your team, you say, look, without quality, you don't need oh and and so, yes, we have to work safely, but we, we need to not be scared of safety. And that's probably with my experience in the mining industry, safety was everything and organisations really struggled to cope commercially uh, because safety took over every single discussion. It says, oh, you know, we can't talk about, we can't talk about production and finance and profitability because, you know, that would be unsafe. So we really got to think about that uh, and, and, and think about how we can adjust that. The core business just doesn't get included in the system. Uh, so we, we often see as assessors these systems that exist out in the, you know, the outer reaches of the organisation, but the organisation sort of ignores that in its day-to-day -day operations. And, and we see this, this hustle that happens in the 24 or 48 hours before an assessment to tidy up the management system so it can be audited. Um, I guess um, I've had this analogy I've used for a very long time is why bother cleaning the house before the party? So you either just keep the house tidy the whole time or tidy the house after the party. 
So some of you might be having a chuckle now, um, but it's something to consider in terms of how we, you know, how we approach this issue of actually making our management systems part of our day-to-day -day operations and how we control our day-to-day -day operations. Um, financial matters are not included in your typical quality system. I've spoken at length about that already. Environment management never gets a look in, particularly in a quality safe environment system. Environment sort of just tucked away in the corner and it's really not considered. And, and I think people miss the critical point there. And without sort of going to a whole training course about environmental management, most organisations with an office space administrative process really say, well, we don't have an impact on the environment. So one question that you can write down, how could we help our customers with their environmental performance? And how, or well, the second question, how could we help our suppliers with their environmental performance? So if you can answer both those questions, that's the real risk management from an environment perspective. And you don't need to talk about it all the time, but you know, are you happy that your business is doing everything it can do, and then you're making a contribution to your customers, and you're making a contribution to your suppliers in terms of knowledge, uh, ask the questions, and collaborative partnerships. Uh, common struggle, man management just don't buy into it. They don't buy into the system. They don't buy into the integrated system. They don't give a shit about the quality management system. We just do it to get certified, to do it, do this contract. And I think you're really losing out on the core benefits. Um, and it's obviously not a priority for the organisation and, and that's our biggest struggle um, and the biggest struggle of, of our colleagues like yourselves that are members of our best practice family. You sit there as a management representative and you just have this issue where it's just not a priority for the organisation. The organisation is trying to, you know, they, in, in one breath they're saying, look, we're just trying to be financially stable and we're trying to make a profit this month and, you know, things aren't going well. But you're controlling this whole management system that's the operational hub of the business and it just completely gets ignored. So we see that conflict and, and I just sit back and smile nowadays because it's just, it's just a ridiculous excuse. So it's about these management systems being the core operational hub of the business and they, they create financial benefits and they create risk management and they create sustainable operation of the organisation. So how do we do that, you ask? Jack, far away. Okay. So where could you start and what could the process be? So I've really thought about this. Um, I appreciate that I'm taking a philosophical high point on this, but I think about, you know, when I'm thinking about answering your questions here and providing solutions, I hear everybody's frustrations, I hear everybody's concerns, and I appreciate them. And I, and I appreciate, because I know that it's challenging to run a business and negotiate with stakeholders and have influence um, through the organisation. So I'll talk a little bit about more, more about that in the next slide, but, but in terms of if you wanted sort of a checklist, if you like, and um, please screenshot this if you, if you want, I'll get out of the way uh, so you can see everything, um, is that figuring out what the benefits are to your organisation of integrating the management system or having a management system. But importantly, this point here is not you personally. So the benefits to the organisation not you personally. Now, I have team members in this business that get frustrated because they've got a lot of work to do, but they forget that they're employed to do that lot of work because there's different ways of running and structuring organisations. And it is important, and I probably see that um, naive and um, uh, career immature, so not immature, but, but there's immaturity in the career approach of some individuals is that they don't sort of shoulder the heavy workload to make the rest of the organisation's life easy. They write lots of stuff into policies and procedures and push it out just to sort of make themselves redundant. And I often hear people talking about preparing management systems so they can make themselves, sort of write themselves out of a job. Um, I hear safety practitioners saying, I'm just a consultant to the business. But then you talk to the CEO and the CEO says, look, I put that person in position to do that job and be the policeman so that I'm confident that something's being managed. So we have these two distinct issues. And so I think it's really important that it doesn't get thoroughly unpacked is figuring out what the benefits are to your organisation. And, and even if you've got two columns, what's the benefit to you personally, you know, in your role in terms of making your job easier, um, but then also what are the benefits to the organisation? Then pitching the value and benefits to your decision makers and leaders so that it's the organisational benefits and pitching those, having the top five, that's the vision, the mission, that's the why uh, of, um, of this integrated management system or the management system in general. Uh, get to know each of the standards intimately. There are no shortcuts to reading 
each of the standards and understanding, particularly as an integrated management system practitioner, whether you're a manager, whether you're working the system, you know, I know there's a few senior business owners even in this presentation listening, you guys listening out there. Um, so it is important to get to know them intimately. I have to learn them, I have to read them. I haven't got a shortcut. Uh, there's a free checklist you can download from our website, the IMS checklist, uh, in the same place as you registered for this webinar. It's a free checklist, there's one there for quality, there's one there for safety, there's one there for environment, there's one there for IMS, and there's one there for 27001. And there's nothing beats knowing those standards intimately because you'll start to get the feel of what's going to work. And so taking the time out to read them, uh, pr you know, print a copy, get a pencil and a highlighter and scribble all over them and make notes and they'll become a real live living, breathing guideline. And that's what I've got. I've got four of those standards. They're in the in-tray. They sit on my desk all the time. In that in-tray in the corner of my desk there, you, you know, you'll see on YouTube what my office looks like. They sit there, I pull them out, and I look at a clause, and I put them back, and I think about how it applies on a day-to-day -day basis. So it's definitely, whether it's you or it's a delegate in your organization, intimately understanding not just the ISO standards, but all of the requirements. So respective professionals. In the org chart here at Best Practice, we have a financial executive, a sales executive, an operations executive, a marketing executive, um, and then a, a compliance and quality manager executive. And I ask those professionals to understand their requirements and their stakeholders so we can come together for an integrated risk approach. And I'll, I'll talk about that on the next slide. Um, in terms of what you're going to integrate, um, I think there is an important step there, which is to draft up, draft up and map uh, I've got it here, draft up and map the matching elements um, so that you can see what your compliance requirements are, some of the simple stuff like management review, internal audits, those elements. Um, implement one central management review. Excuse me for a moment. So where we're involved in terms of certifying the quality safety environment system and just dealing with an IMS, we want to see one central management review. And for the most part, if you've applied to us for quality safety environment certification, there's, a, there's an opportunity for a uh, reduced uh, cost and duration, which we offer basically straight up front. As soon as someone says we're going to do quality and environment, uh, there's a 20% reduction in the duration and a 20% reduction in the cost that just gets put on straight away. But what we need to see is one central management review process and one central internal audit schedule and plan for the whole organisation across all sites, across all people. So that's probably the sort of the core of that. Now people ask me how often should I do management review? Well, my response to that question is how often should you look at your business plan? Now I hope there's people out there feeling guilty about the quality of their business plan because the system here when we're talking about objectives and targets and the standards are talking about objectives and targets, the place that you write those is in your business plan, not in your quality manual. If they're in, if it says quality policy, quality objectives, scope, and that's your system, then straight away you haven't got an integrated management system because it's not part of the business plan. Now, business plans are a challenge. As a CEO and the owner of a business, I struggle to keep mine up to date. I struggle to think about it. I struggle to think, you know, how does this operate? And I see lots and lots of businesses functioning year on year without them. So they're just sort of drifting. There's no plan, there's no map, there's no navigator for the organisation. So we've figured out how to get it onto one page. It's an A3 sheet of paper. And if you would like to see what that looks like, I'll show it to you. I'm happy to, um, you know, we can do a Skype session or you're welcome here in the office or the next time we catch up for a coffee. Um, definitely I'll show you what ours looks like, how I got it onto one page and what that sort of integrated approach looks like. And then I've got a central dashboard to go with it so that I can check in on it. So one central management review. How often should we have management reviews? We should have them as often as we should be looking at our business plan. And I think quarterly uh, is, is a good frequency. So quarterly looking at the business plan, conducting management review, and then if you look at the ISO 9001 standard or 14001, it talks about the outputs. Okay, what training do we need to do with people? What changes do we need to make to the business? What improvement projects? What is the trends? What's been happening? What are the complaints? All those sorts of things then start to make sense. This is how we're going to grow and push this business forward. But what we see a lot is one annual management review. Why? We do management review because best practice are coming to audit us. We make sure we've done a management review. And what we see is something that, yes, we can tick off that it's been done, but it's completely meaningless. So my challenge to you is to make this thing meaningless. It's, it's part of the strategy process. And I know one of the members of the audience here, and you'll know who you are because I spoke to you yesterday afternoon, um, the strategy session that we spoke about 
where all of your 20 managers got to get together for that strategy session, in the true essence of ISO 9001, that is your management review. And I believe that that would be something you'd do on a quarterly basis to have real meaning for the business so that you can hold people accountable to the plans that you made, the, the challenges you set for yourself and the goals, and then you can measure the results on a, on a scoreboard or a dashboard. Okay, moving right along. Um, I'm obviously very passionate about this subject, uh, so thank you for joining me. Um, I've got four or five more points, Jack, before we flick over. Um, establish your risk identification and prioritization process. And if you don't know what that means, start with a SWOT analysis. If you, don't know, if you don't know what that means, Google it. So risk identification, prioritization, and that's where I would steer you towards ISO 31000. It's a great standard, uh, and that covers that sort of, you know, all right, what are the things we need to work on? What are our priorities process and a process to handle that? Capture your opportunities for improvement. Here at Best Practice, we run a thing called an issues list, and then we also run an improvements register and we use a software product called Asana to manage our, it's a cloud-based uh, improvement system that we can track who's doing what and what improvements we need to make. And that bounces around between the managers. So Asana's the system we use. Uh, I'm not recommending it, I'm just saying that's what we use. Um, I don't get into it on a day-to-day -day basis, but my, my managers do and they seem to like it. Um, uh, avoid writing lots of policies and procedures. Uh, develop behaviours instead of that in terms of how we do things around here. So let's start using a language of how we do things around here. So this is how we do things around here. And that becomes the campaign, the mantra, the behavior with people. How we do things around here is we identify improvements and we document them here in the SANA. Or we, or we get together on a quarterly basis and review our business plan and set objectives and check our budget and work out what we can do to improve the business going forward and what, you know, what our strategic direction will be if it needs to change. That's how we do things around here and it's a really good mantra and it's a really good way of starting to build and, and, and foster the cultural piece that goes with management systems. Uh, and then obviously plan out your dashboard uh, and the reporting deadlines. How are we going Shelley? All good? Uh, so uh, plan out your dashboard and the reporting deadlines and weekly and monthly. So here at Best Practice we run a statistical dash dashboard that's got 30 stats. I ask for those numbers every Monday morning. Now one of the challenges in growing best practice is that's actually becoming quite a burden on some people. So we're looking at the opportunity to improve how those stats are tracked and managed and how does that come out of our CRM. So we've got our CRM database which has got a lot of our operational information in it and it's manually exported. Um, we're starting to build out how we can look at that from a dashboards perspective. So even our CRM is an integral part of our quality management system. So that's just my tip in terms of how I'd sort of kick off this process or revisit it. So if you've already got an integrated management system, uh, can you tick all those things off? And then it's a cycle. So it doesn't just start and stop and it's done. You know, what you're doing, basically doing is you're going top to bottom, top to bottom, and you'd probably even do that on a quarterly basis. Thanks, Chuck. Okay, so the do's, or the opposites, opposites of don'ts, or the doozies, if you like, um, is, you know, I think, I think there's, some, there's some critical points here in terms of setting a vision and a mission for your organisation. And, you know, I know that sounds really fluffy, but, you know, our vision here at Best Practice is to work with companies, organisations and individuals that are inspired to continually improve. And that's really our, you know, that's our unique. And so all of our team here are really looking at that and coming to work to do that on a day-to-day -day basis. And so, you know, without this sort of being a corporate spin, it's where we can start to bring that into our management systems. So if you haven't got that, start to think about how you can get that. If you want some guidance on where to go looking in terms of how to do it yourself or get people to help you, uh, reach out um, and, and I can give you some guidance and direction on that. Uh, obviously one set of business objectives, one set, not something that's in your quality safety environment manual and then something that's in your business plan or you've got a quality safety environment manual and no business plan. It's one set of business objectives and SMART. So SMART is, you know, if you Google SMART objectives, specific, measurable, achievable, realistic and time-based. And so when you have a look at that, so it's, it's just trying to unpack that so those objectives and targets really are your business plan. This is what you're setting out to do. One dashboard with all the important statistics one management review that's done quarterly, one internal audit program, one place for your guidance material on how to run the business and what we need to do, your knowledge management system, one place. One risk management framework that deals with all types of risks, financial, HR, quality, safety, environment, data security, business continuity. One meeting agenda, 
that gives enough time, not equal, but enough time to have all matters of risk discussed per category, particularly when you're talking about that quarterly process of continual improvement, and then separate policies and plans for external distribution when customers or stakeholders require it. So for example, we observe, particularly in the construction industry, but some other industries, people might just need to see the safety plan. And so this is about having customer focus. Rather than trying to convince the customer that your safety plan or the plan you've got has all the elements addressed, sometimes it's just easier and more efficient and a better customer experience to hand over the safety plan, the quality plan, the financial plan. For example, a bank, and I've had some recent dealings with our bank. Um, um, I, won't, I won't be derogatory towards them, but I, I will say it was quite frustrating because we have a quite a modern approach to how we run best practice. But they couldn't even see the distinction of advertising and marketing in our profit and loss. And they said, gee, you spend a lot of money on marketing, but not much on advertising. I'm like, it's the same thing. Anyway, so we've moved everything into advertising on our P&L, and now they're happy. It's crazy, right? But it is one of those things that, you know, so we've got to think about our stakeholders as we try and move forward and we're trying to get really creative and, and you know, have these economic benefits of having these systems. We've got to also just, just be a little bit gentle with some of our stakeholders as they come on that journey with us because they might be a little bit old school and, and certainly the bank that we bank with uh, is challenging from time to time. Okay, thanks Jack. So, our top focus points um, <coughs> is now this is for you guys. I was really thinking about you guys and I was thinking about how can you guys take this message and really work moving forward. And I've thought about myself as the CEO here at Best Practice and what I've got to do to lead my team. And then I've also thought about you know, even our systems manager and then I think about you guys, where you guys are in terms of looking down your list of you know, who's involved in this. And I think probably where I would guide you to focus the next couple of months in terms of your learning and development journey would be enhancing your uh, influence skills. Um, so let's, you know, it's it's uh, it's a quiet room here. There's you guys. It's very intimate. There's no one else watching. It's not a public display of this particular webinar. How are you going to manipulate the people you need to manipulate in your business to get these objectives? So I've used diplomatically this the influence uh, as the word there, but your leadership and influence skills in your role and the people that you need to negotiate with and influence to get to those organisational benefits that we talked about early in the presentation. Learn the art of internal concept selling and pitching ideas, and that's a really critical thing. And I've often observed that systems managers and assessors and the you know the management system industry you know that, that some of you are part of. That, you know, I know there's business owners in this group too, but starting to think about okay, well, how am I going to pitch this concept and consult with everybody? And I heard a really interesting quote this morning with. Uh, a, a, a YouTube video that I was watching, and it was a story about Nelson Mandela. And people talked about, you know, there, there is no doubt, everybody knows that Nelson Mandela was an amazing, inspiring leader in the world, you know, a global world leader. And people sort of asked him, where did he learn to lead, and where did, you know, where did he learn these amazing skills from? And his fa what, what was talked about was his father was a tribal elder and a tribal leader. And that's, so what happened with Nelson Mandela was that he went to these amazing meetings with his father. And what he learned was that his father always spoke last. And so this is something that I picked up as a, you know, a tip of the day, if you like, that I picked up this morning, is, is to say, well, um, you know, going into that management review process, each of you, as the facilitator and the convener of that meeting, and saying, here's the challenge that our business has. I'd like to hear what you guys think about it and what your opinion is on it and then stop talking and speak last. And so from a, an active listening perspective, it's just a good little tip to take away to think about speaking last in terms of how we're gonna solve this as you start to hear and empower people to respond. And so I think that's the concept because the solutions to these challenges are gonna slowly come out. How are we gonna do that? So learning the art of internal concept selling and pitching ideas is gonna help you to this integrated management system objective because we're gonna to start to move out of our quality operational production environment in the business and into the finance team and into the HR team as we try and integrate these management systems. It's all about all aspects of the organisation, every team, every process. No one gets left out, no silos. And so that's an important part there. Even if you're trying to bring quality safety environment together, lots of guidelines on that, lots of books on the ISO store, lots of stuff on the internet about integrating quality safety environment. 
But what I'm really keen to push you guys towards today is really looking at the whole organisation, no silos. So don't leave any silos or any teams out of the integration process. Uh, avoid duplication um, here uh, of the process or having two ways of doing things. Gain commercial efficiency and stay focused on this. Um, focus on strengthening business resilience and that's the risk management piece. So we're starting to con constantly look at the consequences of our actions in all parts of the business and how we can prevent those consequences and what it's going to cost to prevent those consequences and what we can do. Prioritise improvements for big ticket risks. Show respect for all areas of risk and their consequences and not just your personal favourite flavour. So if you're a safety practitioner and you've been charged with this integrated management system, you need to understand that there is this concept that we've got to be very careful in terms of how we're perceived. And if we're perceived to be biased towards a particular topic, then we're not going to get the onboarding and the commitment from the people that we need to, to be part of this process. So there's something to screenshot. Um, obviously, it's going to be part of the presentation, um, but we'll, we'll email that and watch that again. But they would be the top focus points. So, um, Jack, I think we're up to questions. Absolutely. Shelley, what do we got? Okay, start with number one. Yep. Which is, why is organisational purpose important in an integrated management system? So, organisational purpose is important because we're starting to look at what's the direction that we want to go and that starts to unpack what the risk horizon is. So here the purpose of best practice is to help businesses with business improvement and so what we don't do is we're not bankers, we're not construction company. And so we can start to really focus down and have a laser focus on the types of risks that we need to manage. And then that's going to set the flavour for the rest of our management system. Yep. Next, um, can other management systems be integrated, not just quality, safety and environment? Absolutely. So that's what we've talked about today. I'm just going to check my phone here for LinkedIn messages as well. Um, so in terms of... Um, uh, other management systems, obviously financial, risk, business continuity, uh, the different, any of the ISO systems that are following that business improvement management system framework, absolutely. So phones here, so if, if you guys want to send me a message on LinkedIn um, or in on Facebook, um, I've got the LinkedIn Messenger app open. Um, and also, if you can find me on Facebook, you can also message, message me through the Facebook Messenger. What else have we got? Uh, are there any disadvantages to having an IMS? Yes, there's definitely disadvantages to having an integrated management system and, and that's the piece I think, the biggest piece is on stakeholders. So we have um, stakeholders that might be interested, you know, for example, a tender, your organisation is submitting a tender. So getting certified, you want to pick up some work, there's a customer requirement, you've got to get certified. And we think it's, it's beneficial to put together an integrated management system, but then you're tendering to a government department and the government department really isn't geared with the skill set to, to look at an integrated management system because they've got a safety person and an environment person and a quality person. And, and those, person, those people sort of, if that's their career and they're not going to sort of, you know, grow their skills uh, to, to go forward. And so they want to see a safety plan, environment plan, a quality plan. So you do all this work to integrate your system and then you've got to pull it all apart and, uh, and, and, and submit it to each of those people. So that's definitely negative. Um, back when I was sitting on the tender panel, writing all the documents for uh, some of the big tier one builders, we put these amazing integrated plans together to run these construction projects and then we'd submit the tender and they'd want three copies of the integrated plan because they were going to rip it down the middle and the safety guy reviews safety and then the quality guy reviews quality and environment. We wasted hundreds of thousands of dollars doing that stuff um, when we should have just, you know, you know, I'm learning, right? I'm sharing you, with you guys what I've learned. We should have just written separate plans way back then. Uh, can organisations of all sizes and industry integrate their systems? Or is yes. Just a small unit? So the question is, uh, can organisations of all sizes and all industries integrate their systems? And the answer to that question is yes. So um, you can be any sort of organisation and you can say, I think we're getting the thread today from the feeling of the conversation is around you know, integrated risk management and looking at that risk horizon and starting to, you know, in, in a risk workshop, if you like, start to unpack where you know where we're going to talk about those different things, and then what that's going to mean for how it's going to be brought through that integrated process. Anything else? Not yet. All good. Not yet. Hang on. Nothing on Facebook yet. Okay. So have I asked? Have I answered everyone's questions? Call me if you need to. I'm holding my phone. <laughs> 
We're happy? How are we going for time? Spot on. Okay, what I'm going to do is, if we haven't got any more questions, you can text me if you've got my number. You can message me on LinkedIn uh, after this presentation. I'm going to be around for the next couple of hours. I'll, and I'm, well, I'm not going anywhere because I'll still be alive tomorrow. Uh, so if you have got any questions, um, a part of this time, it's for you guys. It's for me to answer your questions. Is there things that you should look at? Is there directions you should go? If you want some re reading material, uh, definitely I would recommend having a look at ISO 31000, the International Risk Management Standard, and that's available from ISO.org. Um, have a look at this presentation and have a look at those principles and concepts. There are free checklists available on our um, training portal that's attached to our website. Uh, so where the training courses are, there's checklists, there's an integrated management systems checklist there. Uh, there is also individual courses. So there's a number of individual courses. So when I said get to know the standard uh, and get to know the individual standards that you need to comply with, we've prepared three courses. So um, there's a course on ISO 9001 and we go clause by clause through that. There's one on 14001, the environment standard. We go through that clause by clause. There's a course on ISO 45001. We go through that standard clause by clause. So uh, download a copy of the gap analysis checklist uh, for the standard, get a copy of the international standard, and I'd highly recommend purchasing those courses um, and, and, and going through those courses because they're going to give you that insight so that you can then get a, an appreciation of what each standard requires so that you can do that map that we talked about in that instruction. Now, I think Shelley is going to email out uh, an opportunity that's just for you guys, and I'm not going to sell you on it right now, but she's going to send you out an email with an offer where there's a big discount on those three courses that we think are complementary to uh, this webinar, and it's just for you guys. So for you guys that paid for this particular course, uh, we're going to give you the fee for this webinar, uh, plus more as a discount in, in purchasing some of those product, products. So we're going to give, that, give you that as a credit. Um, so the credit that you paid today for the webinar, we're very grateful for, but we'd like you to use that towards um, a course if you think it's relevant. Um, into the future. So, um, so thank you. Thank you very much for joining us today. Uh, it's been excellent. It's been a really good opportunity for me to consolidate this content, share it with you, answer your questions. If you've got more questions, please message me on LinkedIn, uh, on the LinkedIn Messenger. So connect with me on LinkedIn, please, and then send me a message if you've got questions. I monitor, the, I monitor LinkedIn a number of times a day. So I monitor every single day of the week uh, so that I can answer people's questions and um, and converse with people. Um, if you want to have a giggle and a chuckle, have a look at Instagram, um, Shelley's quotes and the crazy stuff that goes on in the office here, and also our YouTube channel. Um, what I'd ask you to do with the YouTube channel is if there are videos there that you feel your organisation needs to see, it's really easy just to copy the link to the video so and share it and just email that link out to anyone you feel that needs to see it. I'd be very grateful because it's why we do this stuff. It's to help you guys. It's done, it's recorded, it's a video, it's easy. Um, and, and it's there to help you guys and make your job easier. And the last request I've got, if you feel there's a particular topic you would like us to cover or a particular part of the standard and you think there'd be, it'd be really cool to have it covered in a video and you can share it with three people, Jack and I'll shoot it for you. It's easy for us to do. You know I'm a big talking head and I don't stop. So I can definitely do that for you. I can get videos put together and that's what it's all about. So any more questions? No. Aren't you happy? Okay. Yeah. So we're going to call it quits there, ladies and gentlemen. I am very grateful for your time. Uh, for those of you that haven't met me before, I'm Kobe Simmet. Uh, for those of you that's the first time interacting with the Best Practice family, thank you very much for joining us. I'm very grateful. I'm here for you. Um, anything that I can do to help, anything I can do to be of assistance, reach out to me and I'll do my best to look after you. Thanks very much. I hope it's, what is it, Thursday? No, it's Wednesday. Getting ahead of myself. So it's Wednesday. Um, I hope you all have a great weekend and, um, and we're looking forward to some cooler weather here in Sydney. Uh, so um, as we cool off now, we're into autumn, first day of March. Thanks very much for watching everybody. I'll see you next time on Best Practice TV. Bye for now.